of Chassidus, of Yiddishkeit, particularly pointers that we can take from the from the story of Yud Beis Tammuz. We all know the basic story of Yid Beis Tammuz. Yid Beis Tammuz was a very, it is a very important day in the annals of Yiddishkeit Judaism in general, and Chabad, Hasidus in particular. And the danger of Yud Beis Tammuz was precisely came as a result of the Rebbe says, standing up to a communist regime that was bent on destroying all um, every every vestige, any any trace of Yiddishkeit. And the Rebbe stood up to them. As a result, he had personal suffering. But as a result, also, ultimately, he defeated them. There are several things that I would like that we should focus in on on the Rebbe's work in New Bay Stamps that, that ultimately resulted in New Bay Stamps. Even Jewish, the, the, the Jews of Russia, <coughs> particularly the religious Jews, were in a very difficult situation from every angle, religious angle, and and the physical, financial angle. Because if you wanted to keep Shabbos, there was no way, <coughs> since all employment was under government control and in the government if you abstained Shabbos you would immediately suspect that you were keeping Shabbos for religious reasons and you would be summarily dismissed and not only dismissed from your job it would be forbidden to be hired and, and elsewhere And then there are all kinds of different consequences as a result. Just to give you an inkling of the beauty of that a government, they would fire a person and sign him off as an unhirable, and then they would accuse him of being a parasite. You know what parasite is? Parasite? Parasite. They would do this in what circumstances? Just there is they would fire a person from his job, preclude him from being hired elsewhere. Just if they didn't like him, or if he's Jewish? Well, for whatever reason, like if he didn't work in Shabbos, for whatever reason. And then they would accuse him of being a parasite, and the parasite, in under communist uh, doctrine, is the worst thing. You're you're a criminal. You don't want to work. <laughs> so he was, he was being just torn in every direction. So they suffered, in, you know, physically and all that. And the Rebbe, 
set out to help them in every direction, in every aspect. But yet, primarily, his emphasis was to provide Yidin with the ability to keep Yiddishkeit. To have kosher food, to have kosher mikvahs, to have chadorim for children to learn, to have a shul and such things. In other words, the rabbi clearly stated in his effort that in the Jewish people there is the body and there is the soul. And if you, the first thing you have to preserve is the soul. That is the, the essence of the eat. We all personally recognize this, but when we read and we learn from the Rebbe's activities, we see to what extent this is true and to what extent the Rebbe emphasizes. To us, here in Yeshiva, this is the chance that each one has, has at this stage of the at this stage of their lives, to replenish their souls, and surely we have concerns about the future and how are we going to establish ourselves <coughs> and so forth. But we always have to remember and recognize that as long as one's alive—I don't mean physically alive, but alive in spirit. You can, you can make your way in the world. When you lose your spirit, when you lose any direction, you lose purpose. And purpose becomes just to sustain yourself and maintain yourself. Then you can't accomplish anything. Then, of course, you also don't have a purpose in the two meaning. Every day that we struggle over here, we struggle over words, we struggle over sentences, and we struggle over ideas, we have to understand that each struggle strengthens your mission. And puts you up are much higher than the physical world and allows you to to look ahead from a different perspective so that challenges in the world will not will not stump you, will not look so insurmountable. Rashi explains that in the Chumash, in the Chumash Bereshis, so there are two Pashiyas, there's Pashas by Yishlach, followed by Pashas by Yeshev. At the end of Pashas by Yishlach, the Torah lists all the alufim of Esau, all the the um, the kings and the rulers of Esau, and then it follows by Yeshiv Yankiv with Yankiv with him. 
So Rashi says, what is the connection between enumerating the the alufim, uh, uh, the counts of the rulers of Esau, and then go straight to Yashif settled in that canal. Esau went to a, a, to Harseir and he built a whole kingdom and so forth. And Yankim just settled in that canal with these few people. And Rashi says that Yankim, when he saw all these alufim, he thought to himself, how am I ever going to be able to to face up to these powers? So immediately after that, the Torah says, Eilat tell this Yankiv Yosef, that Yankiv also has Yosef. In, in effect, Yankiv has Yosef and he has all the Shvotim. And the power of Yankiv through the Shvotim, through Tzadikim, through Torah and Mitzvahs. What was Yosef? Yosef was a tremendous Tzadik. What was, where do we see at Yosef's, Yosef's Tzitkis? Yosef's Tzitkis showed itself that even when he was in Mitzrayim, alone, thrown away from his home, in bondage, in slavery, in captivity, and yet nothing faced him, even while he was in captivity. He was the same Yosef. You know the story that when Yosef came, he was in charge of the prison. And Yosef came one day and he saw the ministers of Pharaoh that he was serving. He saw that, that they were sour in their face. He was taken aback. Why are you so sour? Can you imagine? Yosef was in the prison. He was a servant boy serving these ministers. So being sour, that should be the, the, the standard of the day. Right? Why should be surprised if anybody is sour in that dungeon? And yet, when he saw them down, he said, Why are you so sour? Why are you so down today? He couldn't understand why they are so down. <laughs> How is this? Because if you're Yosef, the son of Yankiv, nothing faces you in the world. You're here to do your job, whatever, whatever the reason, and the labor to put you there. But you know that Hashem is with you, and you're still serving Hashem. And it keeps you going with the same spirit. And you're surprised if somebody is unhappy. This spirit is what the Rebbe sent out under communism to salvage for the Jewish people. And we know that these Hadorim that the Rebbe built, they, they, they couldn't be called schools, you know, these underground rooms where quietly one rabbi taught a little group of boys and uh, for a few weeks and then afterwards they had to move elsewhere and, and move elsewhere. This Hadorim, this is what saved the, the, the Russian Jewry and kept the Russian Jewry aflame for all these years, for 70 years, until at Bar Hashem it was, it was a revolution, it was broken, the back of the enemy was broken. And uh, and Yiddishkeit is flourishing today. Yiddishkeit is flourishing today in Russia. And the reason it's flourishing today is because it was kept alive all these years. This is like a person who is Rahman al Islam faint, who is very weak very sick. As long as he is alive, as long as he can breathe, as long as he breathes, even artificially, even with, with, with um, um, assisted breathing, 
As long as he's alive, he can ultimately be revived. Through a miracle, through all kinds of efforts, he can be revived. But if Hatsasholam, he loses that, he stops breathing, he stops, he's not alive, then, then that's the end. Then you can't revive him anymore. With all the effort that they ever put in, and then you know, that, uh, briefly I want to tell you, that even the big Rabbonim in Russia, contemporaries of the Rebbe, who were all responsible to guide the Jewish people, they all gave up. Not only they gave up, but they even discouraged the Rebbe. They all said to the Rebbe that this is an impossible task to fight this, this vicious government. And therefore, they, you should give up before you start. And the rabbi wouldn't give up. And uh, as a result of that, he kept Yiddishkeit alive to whatever extent. But it was, there was a life in there. And then when it was permitted to live, it, it revived completely. And now in Russia, he's a fully living Yiddishkeit. The way the Rebbe set out to keep Yiddishkeit in Russia was not just by providing a mikveh and kosher food and things that that um, uh, adult people can can hold on to and uh, kind of tell their children this is how you're supposed to live. But the Rebbe actually established Chabdori learning places where the children would learn olive bays and they would learn to read, they would learn chumash, they would learn gemara, to whatever degree, whatever degree they were able to go to. Now you're learning gemara and you ask yourselves, I'm learning or whatever I'm learning. What, how is this teach me? What does this teach me about my life? I'm learning things that practically speaking I don't have any particular use for it. It doesn't tell me anything practical. If I need practicals, so I pick up the Shukhmur. And I learn what I'm supposed to do at best. But when I'm learning, I'm learning the whole, all the debates in the Gemara and the differences between Rashi and Toysvus and all of the intricacies of our learning. What is this teaching? Practically speaking. And yet, <coughs> Even in Russia, where it was a question of life and death, real, literally, the Rebbe insisted that they learn from the start, everything. Not just learn practical things that, that are pertinent to your practical, but learn Komets Aleph O, learn Chumash, learn Gemara, learn Toysvitz, learn everything. Excuse me? I have no concept of what communist Russia was. I do have Would you concept. like to have a concept of it? Well, it helps to put everything in context of how strong of effort it was. Okay, so let me just finish my point and then maybe I'll go back. Anybody else curious about communist Russia? You're not curious. You'd rather forget about them, right? <laughs> um, I would think that we should take a lesson from this, and it's a pertinent lesson for us. We have to know 
that learning Torah, learning what's called the seichel of Torah, the reasoning of Torah, how one thinks from the Torah perspective, even if it is a question that does not have any practical application for you personally, is extremely important. Just as a person has to learn how to breathe in a healthy way, breathing is not just taking oxygen in, air in, and, and pumping it out. You want to breathe properly. Breathing is <coughs> is an act that gives a person the sense of, of life. And understanding and thinking with, uh, according to the cycle of the Torah is like breathing. When we breathe and we live we do not necessarily, we do not, we're not even aware that we're breathing. We're aware of what we, what we say, what we do, what we hear. We're not aware that we're breathing. It seems almost, <coughs> um, inadvertent. And yet that's the life. There is a clear difference, <coughs> very significant difference <coughs> between, <coughs> excuse me, between the thought process of Torah and the third thought process of the world. It's a different process, a different approach to things. This is why it says that. For instance, the halacha is that you're not allowed to go to a Goisha court. You have to go to a Besli, that Paskin Sapitoy. And it says that this thing that you have to go to a Besli applies not only in cases where the Besli would, would rule differently than the court, and therefore you have to go according to the ruling of the Torah. Not necessarily so. Even in instances where the court may rule exactly identical to the way it is in the Torah. You still have to go to a best. Why? Because in a ruling, it's important not only the ruling, but it's important <coughs> what is the background for the ruling. What is the reasoning for the ruling? And the reasoning of the Torah is completely different than that of the of the secular world world. In principle, when we learn Torah, we once discussed this at great length here in one of these sessions. <coughs> if you recall, I explained to you what the Gemara the Hachom the Gemara says that when you learn Torah, there is an ingredient called Hamoir, Hamoir Shabbat. <coughs> Torah is called Oir. Oir means light. Light means it illuminates, it tells you how to understand right and distinguish right from wrong. But just as a light has a source of light, has a luminary, just like the light of the sun has a sun. Light is not created at this place, light has a, has a source. <coughs> so too, the light of Torah has a source. And the, and the, the logic of Torah, the way Torah comes to its conclusions, it connects you not just to the logic and to the reasoning of Torah, but it connects you also to the moir, to the source of the light. So that we become aware, not just of, of the righteousness of the ruling, 
but we become aware that behind this ruling there is a Torah, there is God. And effectively, it is God himself who is issuing this ruling. And therefore, by learning Torah, we connect to the, to the essence of the, of, of the Godness of the truth. So when you learn possibly the simple logic of Torah, <coughs> the logic itself connects a person to the source and the basis of that logic. And it opens up his mind and gives him a totally different perspective on everything. It gives him a perspective and shows him how to look at things in the world <coughs> from a Torah perspective. And this is why it is extremely necessary to learn the logic of Torah, the logic of Gemara, <coughs> even if you're dealing with questions that are not necessarily pertinent. And this is what we saw, that the Rebbe put all his effort, the tremendous mysterious nephews and the tremendously trying circumstances, setting you know, exposing himself and he's succeeding to tremendous dangers, to certain dangers, not doubtful, but for sure, to assure that there is a hater that learns Gemara, not just um, Shulchan Lok. So if you have healthy Jews who know how to think, how the Torah thinks. In line with this, I would like to um, sidetrack a little bit. And um, speak another another aspect that has to do also with with the, the, the Seichel of Torah and so forth, Seichel in general. <coughs> says that this is a little bit in connection to the Hasana, you know, observations of the Hasana last night. I just want to uh, alert us to certain certain points and certain important aspects of growing in, in Yiddishkeit and Exodus. Um, we're now a little bit on the countdown towards Rosh Hashanah. On Rosh Hashanah, we, we do Tkiya Shoifu, we blow the Shoifu. It says that what is the significance of Tkiya Shoifu? Shoifu, he gives out a simple sound without any variations. It's not a musical sound, it's a plain sound. And the point of this plain sound is that this is a sound that comes directly from the soul. Sounds that that are translated into words are also exposing the soul, expressing what I think in, in the soul. But I'm able to contain them in words and to express them. They get translated. It's not the, the sound directly as it comes from the soul. But when there is a a, um, a, a sound coming directly from the soul. This is what's called tshuva. We'll discuss it, you know, when, when we when we come to it. So tshuva is something which comes, which touches the person so deeply that that he cannot express his feelings um, in words, and it gets expressed in a simple sound. And this is the significance of the tkiya shayfar. That's why we blow shayfar. And Rosh Hashanah. Saying that Shoy Rosh Hashanah, we are in a state that we can only sound, we cannot express our feelings.
there is a similar Indian, but at a, at a different level. And that is called Megina, song. Because music, singing, song, and dance for that matter, is also a way and also an expression that comes directly, more directly from the soul than that which is expressed in words. This in fact, what song is, when a person gets very aroused, uh, very much involved in, in a, in a, uh, in simcha, or in, even in deep thought, it comes out in a song, because, because his, his sense of what, what he's experiencing cannot be contained in words and comes out in song. And the same thing is dance. What is dance? When the person can't contain his excitement, he can't contain his, his um, arousal, he comes out in a dance. But there's a big difference between song and dance and, and Tkia Shafer. Tkia Shafer is a simple sound. Just a, a sound. Because there, uh, it, it, it's a... <coughs> the idea itself cannot be expressed except in a simple sound. Song, on the other hand, has, a move, has already a, a um, structure. Song has a structure. There are different movements, different sections to the song. There are slower songs, there are, there are faster songs, there are songs of simcha, there are songs of reflection, there are all kinds of different songs. <clears throat> just as it is important that we should learn Torah with our seichel so that we understand we understand the seichel of Torah it is also important that we understand and, we, and, and, and bring a song itself also through through the seichel. In other words, song is not just merely screaming it out. The song is something that involves and uh, the feeling and involves the seichel and involves the, the soul. It's important that a song be sung orderly, correctly, and, and, and the song should express what the song is supposed to express. Now, the song is not like a scream. It expresses a certain message. And if we sing the song with attention and, we, and, and correctly, we pay attention to it, then in fact it does it does bring out a certain intellectual feelings certain intelligence to it just as when we were learning the trop I pointed out the trop from the uh, the Nikudas, that each trop has that the, the trop and the structure of it has a message it's not just a sound up and down But I want to, as I said, this is a sidetrack, but I, I felt it important <coughs> that we, we learn to sing songs correctly, not just screaming them out, and we learn to dance in harmony. Dance does not mean jumping up and down. Dance means to dance in harmony, to dance together. 
I'm not saying you should learn steps, you know, in the, in all kinds of different things, but still the, the human being has to be in harmony all the time. This is a natural thing for the human being. Just as when you're walking, you know that when you put the, the right foot out, the next foot is going to come to the left. You're not going to put the right foot again. There has to be a balance. <clears throat> and, and so the same thing is in everything that a person does. <clears throat> there is a certain term called clumsiness. Clumsiness is not is not uh, a nature in the person. Clumsiness many times comes because a person doesn't pay attention. Just when a person, uh, when a person's shirt is sticking out, it's very easy to tuck it in, but because he doesn't pay attention, so it sticks out. The same thing in all aspects. It's important that we should know that we are chsinim, and to us the neshama, the, the pnimis is most important. But the pnimis itself comes through the conduits of intel of seichel. And that is the only way that it can really be, be <coughs> focused properly. And, and bring out the, the proper benefits. We know, if we want to take the, the, the directive from Yud Beis Tammuz, the Rebbe, who was a Hasidic Rebbe, and his primary function as a Rebbe was, and always continued to be, to teach Hasidus. The Rebbe always said, am I Hasidus? The minute the Rebbe was freed from prison, while he was still in a, in in Silt, while he was still in Kastrama, while he was still in Siberia, before he even came home, before he was even allowed to leave the, the, the prison, you know that Yud Beis Tammuz consists of two days: Yud Beis Tammuz and Yud Gimel Tammuz. Why is it two days? The reason it was two days is, <coughs> on Yud Beis Tammuz. The Rebbe was told that his release papers were, uh, were received. But because the offices, the government offices are closed on that day, for whatever reason, so they will not be issued to him until the next day. So officially he was, in other words, practically speaking, was permitted to leave the day after, which was a Wednesday, Yud Gimel Thomas, but he knew about his freedom on Yud Beis Thomas. That's why it became a two-day festival, two-day yont. So on Yud Beis Tammuz, when the Rebbe was still technically in prison, he was not permitted to leave. But the minute he heard this this tiding, he was told about it. He sat down and said, "Am I Inside the prison? It wasn't a prison. It was it was a, it was the the the, the, the exile." In the area of the prison? Oh. No, no, I'll explain to you in a minute. It's, uh, in Siberia, they send people out and they, they lived in a certain town and every day they had to come to the central office and sign in, I'm here, and they were not allowed to leave. But they had to live in, the, in, in, that, in that area. It was not a very comfortable place to live. But essentially, they, they were on their own. And they lived, they had to live in that forsaken place you know, thousands of miles away from home. But, uh, but they, they, you know, he was allowed, he, in, in that place alone itself, he was, he, he, he lived his own life. That's why he had Chassidim there, that came to be with him. And he was able to say, my Chassidus. He said, my Chassidus. While he was still in prison. So the Rebbe's my, my major function, he was not an administrator of an office. He was a Rebbe. But when he re realized that he has this big task of organizing the, the job the, the, of, of saving Yiddishkeit in Russia, he organized it in the most meticulous way. Everything was registered, everything was clear, everything was extremely orderly. 
And we know that Chassidus always demanded order. By the, by the Rabbein, and the Reb Marashab, in the Reb, and by the Reb Marashab, that's the previous Rebbe's father, in Lubavitch, there was a group of menagni. There was a group of menagni, of singers. That means there was a group of bochni who were especially talented in song, and they were in charge of the singing. So that it's clear from this, I mean, we don't have the term. The point is, we're not, not trying to duplicate what was in Lubavitch, but I want that we should understand that everything in Lubavitch, in Chabad, has an order. And a song has a certain way to be sung, it has to be sung right. And we have to try and, and sing it right. If you sing a song right, it's a different song than we sing it wrong. Totally. Then you get to feel the, the message in the song. And if you and the same thing is in, in dance. Dance is something which which also employs sure it brings that person's energies out and so forth. But at the same time it 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 is expressing a certain thing that he has in his mind. And therefore it has to come all the way. For those who are not familiar with the with the Mesir Snefesh of Yid Beis like Michael pointed out, I just want to briefly um, give, you, give you a very brief expose what what communism was and how it fought Yiddishkeit and how, how what an impossible task the Rebbe had undertaken. Communism, as soon as it came into Russia, which was in 1919-1920, this transformed the entire country into a large prison. It was no longer a country as you know it, as we know it. It was a huge prison, just like in a prison. A person has to be in a certain place, and his his um, the guard, the prison guard, has to know where he is at all times. The same thing was in this large prison. Every person, but in the city that he lived in, if he lived in Moscow, he was registered that he lives in Moscow, and if he went say, to Leningrad or Tashkent, he had to go into the, into the internal offices, in the internal ministerium of that city, and register himself there, and give an alibi, give an explanation what he's doing here. What brings him here? What is his purpose of, of trip? And if a person was caught in the street at night, the rule was that you can, you can go, during the day you can travel, but at night you're not allowed to sleep over in a town that you're not registered. So if you were caught by a police officer at night in a city where you're not registered, you would be imprisoned. This is, this is how 250 million people lived. Every person was under surveillance. They knew every, every, everything, where everybody go about, wherever he went, especially through Mayid. The Rebbe, whenever, wherever the Rebbe ventured, they knew exactly where he was. When they, when they first took the Rebbe in, the questions that they, uh, they asked him, because the Rebbe took very, several, several trips to Moscow, over these years. So they asked him, what was the purpose of that trip to Moscow? And what was the purpose of that trip? What did you do there? Who did you see there? You follow? 
This is the condition. And talk about rule of law, there was no such thing as rule of law. There were laws on the paper, on the books, but that's where they were, not nowhere else. They, they, they were not, they had absolutely no power, no influence whatsoever. The arresting officers who arrested the Rebbe, they had the power without any questions asked, Rahman al Islam, to take the Rebbe and show him. There were many Chsidim who actually went through that ordeal. We know that for a fact. You heard of Rabbi Marozov. Khonim Marozov was a personal friend, was a very close friend of the Kriyadik Rebbe. When they were young, they learned together. And afterwards, Khonim Marozov became the Rebbe's personal secretary. Khonim Marozov was arrested one day, taken away from his home. And, and since then the family had no knowledge of where he was. He vanished. Now, which is some 50 years later, when, when there was a revolution in Russia, and they started, opened, they opened up all the the records, the family found out, it's in the record, that that very day when he was arrested, he was shot. No questions asked, no accounting, nothing. This was the the Russia, the circumstance under which the Rebbe worked, and all the succeeding work with him. And this is how the Rebbe saved Russian Jewry, Yiddishkeit, for Russia and Yiddishkeit for the whole world. I personally was also involved in such an episode. I was a young child in Tashkent. I was in Cheder. And this was a Cheder in a basement, in a, you know, like a semi-basement, where the, the window was on the same level as the ground. Like they have now the semi-basements. Somehow this was like off to a corner, it wasn't visible. And this is where we learned for whatever duration of time that lasted. And um, we had this cheder. In this cheder were maybe seven boys, I don't know exactly how many. There was a little group, a small group of boys, number of boys that learned Gemara, a couple of boys that learned Chumash. I don't know exactly, I was the youngest amongst them. I was Mamash a beginner, I was learning to read. This was the cheder. So in this cheder, there was there was this little window, and at all times there was one boy who was assigned to watch through the window, and if anyone is coming, he should immediately alert the rabbi that somebody is coming. This is how we learned. So one time. It was my job. I was eating for lunch, and the Rebbe was learning with the group that learned Gemara, with the older boys. And it was my, uh, my job. I was told to stand by the window. I had absolutely no idea what this was about. To stand by the window, and if someone is coming, I should tell. So I was eating my lunch, and I see a couple is coming towards, the, towards this house. And I was a very proper boy, and I was looked around, I see the Rebbe is learning, and I was 
think to myself, how can I interrupt? It's not appropriate to interrupt in the middle of learning, people are doing. But then I said to myself, but I was told to tell, so I better, I have to tell. So I kind of whispered under my nose, somebody is coming. I didn't want to interrupt. If they'll hear me, they'll hear me. I said, somebody is coming. So I said, somebody is coming. I said, somebody is coming. I had no idea what, what, what message I'm, giving, I'm, I'm here to give now. And then, completely to my chagrin, completely unexpectedly to myself, <laughs> within a split second, the Gemorrah was stashed away someplace, behind walls, whatever it is. The room was completely changed. The, ta- the table was pushed away to the side, and the boys were sitting on the floor playing cards, and the Rebbe was sitting on the chair watching them. This took two seconds in that long. And this couple came in, and they looked at the children, and I skimmed them like, hey, hey, they, they, they have these, these beautiful mannerisms. And they said, they said the Rebbe had a big white beard, so they said, oh, they're playing Zeb Maroz. No, Zeb Maroz is uh, Santa Claus. And they walked out. So then, that day, you know, the Rebbe canceled the class already, and you know, he, walked, he walked away. This was, I would think, in 1945. Approximately. In 1965, and I was already a married man. One time I'm sitting in Kippur Baniila. I'm sitting in 770. And uh, in those days, it wasn't as big and as packed as it is now. <clears throat> I'm sitting by Baniila. Remember, I was you know, in Baniila with a talus, with a kittel, with a beard. I mean, a totally different person. And I see a person coming in. And I said to myself, I think this was my Rebbe from Tashkent. This was a student. He worked on crutches. So I, so I said to myself, it looks like my Rebbe. So after, after davening, when he was saying Tilim, I walked up to him. And I gave him Shalom Aleichem. As soon as I give him Shalom Aleichem, he looks at me and he says, Abba! Do you remember how you saved me? <laughs> Only then did I really realize what danger he was in. Had I been a nice boy and not followed the, the orders, he would have ended up in Siberia for teaching the boys Gimon. And under these circumstances, there were hundreds of Malamdi throughout Russia who continuously risked their lives in the most literal sense to teach little children Alevays, Ivre, Chumash, and Gimor. So that they would be healthy Jews.
there is a a um, an explanation from the Baal Shem Tov. When Baal Shem Tov explains a posuk in Tehillim, when David Amalek says, Somalachon Nafshi, Komalachon Bissar, everybody knows this song. Beret Siyah Ve'oyev Belimoy, Kein Baal Kodesh Hazisichon Yerusuz Chokwitach. So, what is the meaning of these words? That David Amalek, he was at the time, he couldn't be in Yerushalayim, he couldn't be in Etzisol, he was driven out. And so he said, I am thirsty for, for the Migdos, I'm thirsty for Torah. And then he says, Kreim ba Kodesh Chazisich, that I will eventually come back and see you in Kodesh, in the holy place. So the Baal Shem Tov says that the, the deeper meaning in this post is that when David Amalek was driven out and he could not learn Torah, this is when he felt the real thirst for learning. He really, really felt the, the thirst and, and the tremendous desire for learning. And he was wishing himself, he was praying, that when he returns back in Mitzvah and he is back into Yerushalayim, back to, to where he wants to be, in the holy place, he should have the same desire then as he has now. He should have the same strength of will, the same appreciation of the Gdusha as he has now when he is driven away. So, the Russian Jews, the Russian Bochrim, who were learning, you know, who were driven out from one place to another, to another, I mean, there are many, many stories now recorded, written out, where the Shiva would be driven from one place to the other, and the Bochrim, a Bochrim in those days was considered, you know, a 15-year-old Bochrim was a Bochrim. He would travel on his own as far as needed to find a place where he can learn. He was a broken, he was not a little boy anymore. And the thirst for learning was tremendous. And there was no such thing as wasting a minute. Because wasting a minute is like wasting the, the, the precious life. So now, we are Baruch Hashem in a different circumstance, and we don't have to hide, we don't have to run away, we have then maybe all the facilities available to us. But nevertheless, we have to remember that all the years that we were out of the yeshiva, our Neshama was thirsty for the Torah. And each one of us here has different ideas why he came to Yeshua. Things that he understands what, what he is looking for. He, he, he wants to, to complete, to have some knowledge of this, some knowledge of that. The real reason, the absolute real reason, is because his neshama is thirsty for Torah. And when one sits and learns, even as I said before, things that practically speaking he does not have an application for it, he is actually reviving his neshama. And reviving the Neshama means actually give life to the Neshama. So that now, it isn't just the reason that he thinks it justifies his being here. What he's trying to get. What he's trying to get is fine. This is, 
an alibi. This is how how the Rebbe finds ways to to overcome the Yetzer Hora. But the real reason is that by learning, we're feeding, we're strengthening on the shonis. And as I explained before, that as long as a person is alive, even if he is hardly breathing, ultimately he can be revived, come to life. If Chasu Sholem, he ceases to live, that's when you can revive him anymore. And the Neshomas of every Yid is alive. And this is what, what we're looking for over here. And, we, and the Neshoma is thirsty. And every time, every moment that we lose, that we waste, the Neshoma is crying. Why are, you, why are you depriving me from water? Why are you depriving me from air? Because you're safe, you don't know, you don't understand what you're gaining for it. But I'm gaining for it. Do it for me. Do it for me. Wait for the Neshama. And you won't regret it. Because the stronger the Neshama, the stronger is your spirit. The stronger is your person. And, and, and the more able you are to, to live through your life and to, and to build a life in a successful way. See, that you don't get faced by, by any things that happens in the world. This, the ty- this is a type of learning. This is a type of spiritual food that the Rebbe was working for. This is what the Rebbe was, was, was um, put his life on the line for. The, his chavedim, so to speak, his contemporaries, the, all the, the, um, I mean, all the rabbonim in Russia, until the rabbi changed their minds, they were all basically of the same opinion. It's futile. Don't try. And they were logically right. What are you going to accomplish? Let's say if you get a bocher and you teach him, and two days later he gets caught. And you have to cancel the whole thing. So what did you accomplish? You learned two days. You learned a week. I don't think there was such a thing. It was a cheder that lasted more than two, two, three weeks in the same place. Because it didn't exist. Because once they, they, they followed the traces, they being suspicious. How did these, this couple know to come to this room where I was sitting and learning? Everybody was un- under observation. And they saw boys coming, boys leaving. And somebody must have mentioned, there's some boys coming into this room, and there is a, a crutch, a man on crutches coming in and out. You know, this was, and that's how they came to this room. It was a little hidden room in the, behind an, an alleyway. What made them think to come to this room? Everybody went on the other surveillance. And people had to run from place to place. When they felt that this was dangerous, they would move elsewhere. The Rebbe himself, prior to the, to the big arrest, which ended up in Yudbe Stavros, before that, the Rebbe was away in Moscow. And his, he, he lived in Petersburg. He lived in Petersburg, which in, in Saint, Saint Petersburg, in, in Leningrad, what's called that. And um, he was away in Moscow. And they came to the house to look for him. And somehow the message got around to the Rebbe from Petersburg to Moscow, that he should not come back now because they're looking for him. And just in time, before he was embarking on the train to go home, like Yechonon uh, Marozov stopped him and said, better not go now. So 
So I just want to finish. So the danger was was constant. The ability to say that a bacher will have a normal say that a normal half a year of learning, normal year of learning was a dream. It never happened. They learned at most a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks here, and then. So what did you want to accomplish? What are you going to accomplish? You're going to get Lomdim, you're going to get Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbonim, you're not going to accomplish anything. And the Rebbe said, absolutely, that's what I'm going to accomplish. Because the minute a person learns, just like when a person puts on film, we know the difference between a person who has put on film once, one has not put a film at all. One has never put on film, it's called the Karkafta Lemonach film. It's a, it's, it's a, altogether it's such a Begach Monus. The same thing, any amount of Torah one learns, knowledge-wise it may be limited, but in terms of the highest that it gives him, is not limited. So we, can, we, we should remember, we cannot judge by what we perceive is our gain from learning. There's an Ashoma in us that lives from this and comes to life. Yes? Um, it's pretty good to be coming <clears throat> to the approach that uh, it might be very difficult but we'll win? Or was he coming from the approach that it doesn't matter if we win, we just have to do everything possible to learn to Learn for preserve time. Was it a kind of situation where he, he thought that actually he could win, or a situation where he, he just thought uh, he. The Friedrich Rebbe always knew that he would win. Why? Not because it made sense. Not because it made sense. There was no basis for it. But because when you know what the truth is, you know that the truth must be there. I want to tell you, you're not familiar with the Second World War either, but you, you know a little more, you know the atrocities that the Second World War brought on the whole world. It's unimaginable. You're talking about 50 million people, I mean, you're talking about... A guzman, so to speak. You can't even begin to surmise what what that war did. Devastated. There was absolutely no respect for human life whatsoever. And this was the Nazi beast that was swallowing up the whole world. And people mobilized to go and fight them. from all over the world until America came in. So, as people were surmising, were thinking about what's happening in the world, <coughs> and they saw this beast swallowing up one country after another, I mean, without resistance almost, you know, just coming in and taking it over. What did people think? How can they live with this? How can they live with this? I mean, this is the mamash and the, the worst of the worst. And yet people went around the normal, normal life, whatever that was possible. The reason a life went on to the extent that it went on was that it was clearly ingrained in the human mind that God is not going to forsake the world in the hands of the Nazis. There's no way that can happen. The scare was how much suffering are we going to have to go through before they are defeated. But that they will be defeated was never a doubt. Because how can it be? How can it? How can it be otherwise? 
God hasn't abandoned his world. So there's tremendous suffering and a tremendous effort is necessary, but there was never a doubt in the Rebbe's mind, never, that the kindness will be defeated and that Torah will survive because that's the only way it can possibly be. And again, even from this perspective, we ourselves also have to know that each one of us, because we have a Nishoma, there's no way that any Nishoma is going to drown. No Nishoma is going to get lost. The question sooner or later, and how much difficulty one has to go through to revive it. But every Nishoma is going to survive. Because the Nishoma is the real thing. Nothing is going to get lost. So, let's get on with it. Not waste a minute. Not have to lose courage. To know whether you understand what you learn or don't understand what you learn, whatever you get in is yours. Even the struggle is, is, is yours. Even the struggle. You try once, you try a second time, a third time. Each trial brings you closer to the real thing. will be much less.